Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. In an older video, I covered the Victorian obsession with giant sea serpents, which were treated as real flesh and blood undiscovered animals. While there is no hard evidence for the existence of such leviathans, snakes have proven quite capable of moving into aquatic niches, with some extinct forms reaching relatively large sizes. In fact, some paleontologists have argued that all snakes descend from aquatic ancestors that were close relatives of the mosasaurs, with distinctive serpentine features such as the loss of the front limbs, fused transparent eyelids, and lack of external ear openings evolving in a marine setting. However, snake relationships have proven controversial. While they are definitely squamates, and developed from four-legged lizard ancestors probably during the late Jurassic, their exact position is uncertain. Over the years, relationships not just to mosasaurs but to varanids has been proposed, although the most recent studies have found snakes to be more distantly related to monitor lizards than was once thought, instead recovering them as members of the clade Toxicophera, being equally close to anguimorphs and iguanians. Other paleontologists have proposed a burrowing origin for snakes, suggesting descent from a putative ancestor somewhat similar to a fossorial version of the living earless monitor of Borneo. Indeed, one of the earliest and most basal known snake relatives, Najash rio negrina of Cretaceous Patagonia, was a burrowing animal that still possessed a sacrum and fully functional yet small hind limbs. The situation is not helped by the fact that snakes have a pretty poor fossil record, as their skeletons are often small and fragile, with remains often consisting of just a few vertebrae. While I personally side more with the burrowing hypothesis, it is also true that some of the best preserved early snakes lived in nearshore marine habitats. One family of these were the Similiophiidae, which related to the warm shallow Tethys Sea during the Cenomanian stage of the Cretaceous, between about 99 and 93 million years ago. These snakes are known from well-preserved near-complete fossils, which have given scientists a good look at the early evolution of the group. All species have been recovered from what is now Southeast Europe and the Levant, with many specimens having been found in Palestine and Lebanon, which, due to terrible current events in the region, I feel it is important to highlight. These include the genus Pachyrachis, which was found near the city of Ramallah in the West Bank. Measuring about 1.5 metres, or about 4.9 feet long, this snake displayed many typical features of the family Similiophidae, including thickened ribs and vertebrae, which would have functioned as ballast to decrease the buoyancy of the animal, allowing it to dive beneath the ancient Cretaceous seas that it once inhabited. Notably, Pachyrachis also retained a pair of small hind limbs, complete with a hip, knee and ankle joints. Some modern snakes, such as pythons and boas, do still possess very reduced remnants of hind limbs, but these consist only of small spurs. The related genus Eupardophis was native to Lebanon and was smaller than Pachyrachis, measuring about 85 centimetres or 33.5 inches long. It possessed a laterally flattened body and a short paddle-like tail, being well adapted for swimming in warm shallow seas. Eupardophis also retained hind limbs, which included tarsal bones, but seemed to lack phalanges, while the pelvic bones were small and loosely arranged. Its remains were found in the Sanina formation, with the snake living alongside a variety of other animals, including pterosaurs, the potential mosasaur relative Pontosaurus, and a highly diverse array of bony fish, some of which would have been prey for Eupardophis. Another family of late Cretaceous marine snakes were the Nigerophiids, which had a wider distribution, being native to Africa, Madagascar, India, and Eurasia. These animals first appeared during the Campanian at least 72 million years ago, with the genus Nubianophis of Sudan being the oldest known form. Nigerophi had survived the KPG extinction event and persisted into the late Eocene, when they probably became extinct as a result of grueling global climate. They may have been closely related to a more famous ancient lineage of snakes, the Paleophiids. These probably diverged from other members of Serpentes roughly 70 million years ago, although all Cretaceous age fossils attributed to the group are pretty dubious. The oldest definitive remains hail from the early Eocene about 56 million years ago, with Paleophiids clearly thriving in the hothouse conditions of the Paleogene, possessing a very wide range, encompassing the Americas, Europe and the northern half of Africa. The small genus Archaeophis was endemic to what is now northern Italy, with its remains having been found at the Eocene deposits of Monte Volca near Verona. 
It was an inhabitant of warm coastal areas, and probably fed mostly on small fish. Meanwhile, the common genus Pterosphenus contained up to five species, and was found from South America to Central Asia, possessing a body that was strongly laterally compressed, as well as a paddle-like tail. This is a snake very well adapted for marine life. While mostly represented by fossilised vertebrae, these are enough to demonstrate that this was a relatively large reptile, mostly ranging between 8.2 feet and 15.7 feet long. Although the largest known vertebra may have belonged to an individual reaching 19 feet in length, it would have lived alongside a variety of archaeocetaceans, and may have fallen prey to them on occasion. The type genus of the family, Paleophis, was even more diverse, spanning a huge range of sizes and potentially possessing up to 15 species. It thrived across the entirety of the Eocene, being present in eastern North America, Europe and much of Africa, with different species inhabiting marine, estuarine or freshwater ecosystems. Basal forms only possessed moderate adaptations for swimming, while the more derived species were probably entirely aquatic. Interestingly, the vertebrae of these snakes show a high degree of vascularization, suggesting that they had a considerably faster metabolism and growth rate than modern snakes. This may suggest that paleophyids, like other marine reptiles such as mosasaurs, might have developed towards endothermy. The smallest species such as P. casei measured just 1.3 meters or just over 3 feet long, while the most massive form was P. Colosseus from the early Eocene of Mali, being at least 30 feet long, perhaps even up to 40 feet. However, Despite the many images of this impressive snake online, which show it to have been a veritable sea serpent, more recent studies have shown that it was not well adapted for a marine lifestyle. It may then have lived in estuarine or freshwater habitats, living like a more active version of modern large pythons, albeit feeding on proportionally smaller prey. Despite their unusual adaptations, paleophyids died out at the end of the Eocene about 33 million years ago perhaps due to climate change or competition with other marine tetrapods. Another large and potentially semi-aquatic snake from the late Eocene was the genus Gigantophis, which is a member of the family Matsoiidae. Its remains have been recovered from what is now Egypt and Algeria, dating to between 37 and 35 million years ago. A very large snake, this animal measured roughly 7 metres or 22 feet long, comparable to modern reticulated pythons. Although its vertebrae do not show any major adaptations for an aquatic niche, neither do those of living large pythons, and these are often strong swimmers regardless. Given that Gigantophis lived in a coastal environment, it probably spent much of its time in river mouth and estuaries, feeding on fish and relatively small vertebrates that wandered too close. After the extinction of these Eocene forms, two groups of venomous elapids made the transition to marine life, both of which are closely related and developed from terrestrial Australian ancestors during the Oligocene. The elapids are the family that contains the cobras, mambas and taipans, most of which possess rear-facing fangs near the front of their jaws. The sea snakes, while still very much being a part of this group, have developed their own unique features for a life spent in the ocean, including paddle-like tails, laterally compressed bodies and most species give birth to live young. Their ventral scales are often greatly reduced, streamlining the body but making movement on land more difficult. The first group of marina lapids are the members of genus Laticauda, also known as the sea crates, containing eight species. These animals are native to Southeast Asia, Indonesia and Eastern China, with populations reaching as far north as southern Japan and as far east as Fiji. Sea crates are only semi-aquatic, representing something of a transitional phase between more terrestrial snakes and those totally adapted for life in the ocean. They have retained large ventral scales, which enable decent movement on land, but also have streamlined bodies well suited for swimming. Unlike other sea snakes, these animals must still come ashore to lay their eggs. Most species display beautiful striped patterns and dwell in the littoral zone of coastal waters, spending much of their time in the shallows around coral reefs. The yellow-lipped sea crate, for example, hunts in such environments, searching for eels and various small fish, which are killed through the use of extremely potent neurotoxic venom. Some species, such as the black-banded sea crate, which is found across the warm waters of the Western Pacific, find themselves hunted by humans for their meat, particularly by elderly women in the Ryukyu Islands, who catch the snakes with their bare hands in almost complete darkness. 
sea crates can easily be confused with the land crates of the genus Bungarus, and almost certainly evolved from very similar ancestors. A Bungarus-like form also probably gave rise to the other subfamily of marine elapids, the Hydrophianae. These not only contain specialised ocean-going forms, but also many land-based venomous snakes found across Australasia, including the large, fast-moving taipans, the curl snakes of the genus Suta, as well as the Australian copperheads. All of the marine forms are members of the same clade, which appears to have split off from other hydrophenes during the late Miocene about 10 million years ago. Modern members range very widely, being found across the east coast of Africa, much of the Indian Ocean, as well as a great deal of the Pacific, from Japan in the north to the western coasts of the Americas. They are also the only indigenous snakes found in Hawaii. Aquatic hydrophenes are united by being strongly adapted for a sea-based existence, rarely if ever coming ashore, and often struggling to get about if they do so. Like cetaceans, these snakes spend their entire lives in the sea. While most species are highly venomous, the turtle-headed sea snakes of genus Emidocephalus are completely lacking in venom and possess no teeth on their dentary and palatine bones. With this being an adaptation for a specialised diet made up almost entirely of fish eggs, other genera have relatively little information about them online, except for the incredibly successful genus Hydrophis, which contains a staggering 36 species. These can range up to 3 metres or 10 feet long, and despite being incredibly venomous, are often quite placid animals, only biting humans if seriously mistreated. By far the most well studied of these is the yellow belly sea snake Hydrophis platurus, found from the coasts of South Africa to Peru and everywhere in between. As its name suggests, its belly is indeed yellow, while the back is dark brown. Some individuals can even be entirely rubber duck yellow. Spending their whole lives at sea, they prefer to hang out around floating mats of sea kelp, in which they mate and hunt for prey. In the wild, the yellow bellied sea snake eats only fish. It hunts by stealthily approaching its prey, or by waiting motionless at the surface and ambushing fish that come to shelter underneath it, as small fish are often attracted to inanimate objects such as floating debris. With its mouth agape, the snake makes a rapid sideways swipe to snare any fish that comes too close. These snakes are capable of rapid bursts of speed, and can even swim backwards. If suitable conditions form, these animals can gather in groups numbering into the thousands, although it's not really clear why and how. Like other hydrophenes, the species give birth to live young, with its bright coloration warning predators to stay away. Travelling on oceanic currents has enabled this snake to circumnavigate much of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, with cooler temperatures and barriers like the Panama Canal preventing it from expanding further. Had hydrophenes possessed the higher metabolisms of the extinct paleophyids, I wonder just how much further they might have spread. They may not reach the gigantic proportions seen in myth and legend, but sea snakes still have a long and fascinating history. Thanks for watching everyone. As the next episode will be released close to Halloween, I thought it would be appropriate to cover the early evolution of bats, which like the pterosaurs before them, first appear in the fossil record as specialised flying animals with no intermediate forms known so far. See you again soon. Cheerio.